Good morning, everybody. Man, how about worship? I honestly, even the the time that I spent preparing, I honestly was like, man, I can stay there. Like, I truly, there are times where Pastor Brian says, and I have to go, man, he's just kidding. Like, he put in the work. He wants us to hear this word. But honestly, today I felt that, and it was like we could have just stayed there all day. But I truly believe that God has a word for us today. Before I do any of that, I just, I first want to just give honor to the house, and I want to thank Pastor Brian for giving me this opportunity. Um, he's an, for anyone who doesn't get time with him, he's an amazing man of God. Like, you can say that, but to truly feel it, the way he treats his family, the way that he is here, out in the street, it doesn't matter. You get the same man of God, and I'm just thankful that I get to spend time just learning from him and being in his presence. So thank you for that, and I'd like to thank my family. They, they sacrifice a lot for us to do these things, to be up here. And this week was, of course, the other things that I do for the church don't stop in the midst of repairing. And often the family takes the brunt of that time. So a few missed meals, me hiding out in a room, digging into the scripture to see what God has for us. I just want to thank my my wife, Bree, and my daughters uh, for giving me that time. So without further ado, we're going to jump in. Um, Lord God, I just, I thank you for an opportunity to stand up here and to to bring your word to us, God. I pray that this word will not only uh, speak to our hearts, God, that it would move us to a place of change, God, that it would move us to a place where we choose to do something different, God, that it would change our outlook, change the way that we see things, God. We thank you that you've given us an opportunity to worship you today, God, and I pray that we don't take it for granted. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so, I'll give this disclaimer, disclaimer now. I am, have not always been, but I am a crier. Now that I have three girls, I cry. Like, it, it just, I don't know if it's just having them, where it just touches your heart and you become a much more sentimental person. But I'm going to claim it now. So, I've got my handkerchief with me. It may look like I'm wiping away sweat, but most likely as we get into this, I'm going to be wiping away tears. So, I'm going to keep going, though. Hey. <laughs> so... In light of that, as we get closer and closer to the Christmas season, um, and we're in it, I mean, Christmas Day, one of the things I enjoy the most about the season is the storytelling. Stories like The Night Before Christmas or or A Christmas Carol. So in keeping with that holiday vibe, I'd like to start with a story. Now, the story I'm going to tell actually is actually a play-by-play of a video, and it has nothing to do with Christmas, but go with me. It's going to work well for where we're going in the message. Now, I don't know if anyone else has seen this video. Um, but it's this, this, this female snowboarder. She's on the top of this mountain. It looks like it's the middle of nowhere. And she's got headphones in and she's humming a song, listening to music. I believe that she's listening to Christian music, but who knows? She's singing along and she's got her snowboard and she's strapping in. And the video that we have of her is we don't actually see where she's going. We can, the video is set up to where we can see her face and we can see the terrain behind her. It's a weird angle to take, but go with me. So as she's there, she pushes off and she starts heading down the mountain and she's building up momentum. The snow is flying up in her face and she's going along and then out of nowhere, frame of corner, just this massive grizzly bear comes charging into the frame and it's, it's on her heels. And at this point, sweating. I'm looking at her and I'm going, Lord, don't, don't slow down. You're going to die. Don't fall. You're going to die. For anybody who doesn't know, my, my family will attest to this. I have conversations with the TV. 
like especially if sports are going on. There's a lot of back and forth. Anybody else? Anybody else live in this space? Come on, I'm not alone. So back to the story. She's going, it feels to me like an eternity. But it ends up being about a minute, minute and a half where she's working her way down the hill. The bear finally gives up. He realizes that he's not going to be able to catch her and fades out of the scene. And she finally reaches the bottom of the mountain and she stops and takes a breath. And the thing is, she has no clue just how close she came to being lunch. Much like this snowboarder, if we don't know where we came from, metaphorically, what's behind us, we can hum our way through life without ever recognizing the importance of a moment. So, with that in mind, we can become detached from the value of the past. And many times, true stories can lose their impact. So today, I'm going to entitle my message, What's the Big Deal? And to continue in my storytelling adventure, uh, I want to take a look at a story in the Bible, one that I believe many of us would be familiar with. Is that okay? Can I tell another story? Yeah? All right. So let's open our Bibles to Luke 8. I'm sorry, Luke 2, 8 through 14. I'll be reading from the NASB. It should come up on the screen shortly as we read. We're going to start with verse 8. And it says, In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock at night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. And so the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army of angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among the people with whom he is pleased. And the crowd cheered, and there was so much joy. But why does it matter? A baby was born. The baby doesn't really do anything as a baby. He's a baby. His life really won't matter until he actually does something worth celebrating, right? To be honest, I find myself asking the question, what's the big deal? So, with that in mind, where do we start? How do we unpack this question? What's the big deal? Well, to even begin to understand why Jesus' birth was something to be celebrated, we must first, like the snowboarder, look behind us. Look to the past to understand what has already happened. Now, Pastor Brian has touched on much of this in the series as we've been going through Luke. So I, I'm going to trust that many of the things I, I will say today will, will be somewhat familiar. But we're going to get an understanding of why the opening scripture I read was so important back then to hopefully shed light on its important for us now. To answer the question, what's the big deal? So some context. At this point, the people of Israel have been waiting hundreds of years for a promise that God made to, to King Ahaz in Isaiah. And we're going we're gonna to look at that scripture now. It's Isaiah 7, 14. And it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And she will name him Emmanuel. Does that sound familiar from a little bit earlier ago? Anyone who, who doesn't know, Emmanuel means God with us. Or God among us. And that's going to be important as we move forward. So hold on to that. But at this point, the Israelites had gone from God's chosen people living in his favor to a group of people scattered across the land. It wasn't too long after King Ahaz that these things, things really started falling apart for them. The kingdom had already been divided. We had the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. They had already split. And then not too long after this message, they would find themselves under the oppression of foreign rulers. Even while Luke is writing in the time of this, the Israelites are under the control of Caesar Augustus. The people of Israel had not been able to rule themselves for almost 500 years. Now, anybody in here feel like you've had to wait a long time on something? Have you ever had to wait 500 years? Hmm. So, I hope, I hope that gives us a little better understanding of why this birth 
could have meant so much for the people of Israel. Maybe? Are we a little closer? So then let's continue to dig a little deeper in hopes of gaining some more context. So at this point, God is, is literally, he's rolling out the red carpet, giving the announcement its full due. I mean, this is the biggest gender reveal baby announcement ever. Now let's read it one more time. We're going to go through the same set of scripture, but we're, we're going to add onto it all the way through 18. So we'll do chapter 2, verses 8 through 18. Now I want you to listen for the tone and the excitement of scripture. Side note, if you don't often read scripture aloud, if you don't often take a moment to read that aloud, you miss out on so much of the wealth and the joy that comes from scripture, that comes from the text. So as, I listen, as, you, as you listen now, listen for those words that, are, that, that draw the excitement, that show what's going on. So it says in chapter eight, I mean, in verse eight, we're starting there and it says, in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over the flock at night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. And so the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of a heavenly army of angels, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among people with whom he is pleased. And continuing on in verse 15, when the angels had departed from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen him, they made known the statements which were told to them about the child. And all who heard were amazed about the things which were told to them by the shepherds. Now, out of all of these verses, out of this entire passage, I believe there is one that really deserves some extra attention to help us understand why this was such a powerful message for the shepherds and ultimately all of Israel. We're going to zero in on verse 14. We'll go ahead and bring it up on the, on the screen. And it says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. How many of us actually know what, what glory means? When we say glory to God in the highest, do we, do we recognize what we're saying? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> glory comes from the Greek word doxai, which means to, do, uh, to put confidence in and, and boast about or praise something. So when we say glory to God in the highest, we are saying all of my confidence is in you and I boast in your name at the highest level. Sounds different. And then if we go on and it says, and on earth, peace among people. Again, how many of us know what, what peace really means? You guys are, are full of questions today. So I'm so glad you asked. You guys are getting it with me. Peace in Greek is erene, which means to join together or to tie. And in the Hebrew is shalom. That one sounds a little more familiar. I think we're, we're used to hearing that one more often which means to be in the state of wholeness or completeness without any deficiency or lack. Now, I don't know about you all, but when I think of peace, I think of that wonderful moment of time. It happens around 9 o'clock, 9.30 p.m. every day in my house, every evening in my house, where my, all the people who are under the age of 13 are either asleep or in their rooms. Peace. Ooh. But that, that is a perfect example of worldly peace. And no, that's not the peace that we're talking about here. The peace that is meant to be seen here is the shalom of God. The peace of wholeness or completeness without any deficiency or lack. And then finally, with whom he is pleased. Well, who is God pleased with? Come on, I thought you guys would never ask. For this, we're going to look at Hebrews 11.6. We're going to go to the NIV for this one. Hebrews 11.6. Now it says, this is a familiar verse, I think, for everybody, uh, for most of us. I won't say for everyone. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So what do we take from this? Ultimately, God is pleased when we put our faith in him, when we seek him. So now we're going to look at that same verse, verse 14. And we're going to look at it, and it says, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among people with whom he is pleased. What we are actually saying is, God, all of my confidence is in you, and I boast about you at the highest possible level. I am, we are complete, lacking nothing for all who have faith in you and seek you. Whew. Ooh, that feels different. Come on, I don't know, but that, that is a message worth spreading. And that's exactly what the shepherds do. So after all that, I hope we understand why it's so important to them. While, while we move from Malachi, the end of the Old Testament, to Matthew, the beginning of the New Testament, it's simply a few pages that we flip or we swipe left. But understand that for the people of Israel, they had been waiting for this over 500 years. This message of Jesus' birth meant the end of waiting on God to send their Savior. The answer had finally come. But we're still left. We're still left with a nagging question. What does that mean for us? Why is it a big deal to us? In truth, this isn't just Israel's history. It's ours. It's ours. And how do we know this? We're going to jump to verse 10. And it says this, And so the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which is for who? All people. And just in case you were going, man, that's just the Israelites he's talking about. Just by chance, we're not convinced. We're going to jump over to Ephesians 2, 19, also looking at NIV. And it says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but who? Fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So like the shepherds have been given something to celebrate, they're celebrating the birth of our Savior. So now, now the question isn't, what's the big deal? But the question is, are we making a big enough deal? How do we know that our praise of God, how do we know that when we praise him, we're not simply just praising him for what he does, but for who he is? How do we know when our praise is pleasing to God? Well, first, our praise should be expectational. Now, what do I mean by that? We're going to hop through the scripture that we started with, and we're going to look at some examples. So we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. And it says, And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army of angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. Remember? Remember what that means? I boasted you at the highest level. And on earth, peace among people with whom he is pleased. Now, what we can take from this is the angels, man, they came dressed for, their, for the occasion. They came dressed to praise God and their praise was next level. It filled the sky. Whenever an army is mentioned, it's usually in reference to show force or, or majesty. I don't know if anybody else does this, but when I read scripture, I like to kind of like fill in the little spots with little narratives, little things I, might, I think might be going on. And I imagine the angels getting ready for this moment. And they're like, man, hey, Gabriel, man, are you wearing your gold armor or are you wearing your platinum? Man, it's platinum. We're about to praise God. And I'm bringing my favorite horn, too. Like, they are excited about this moment. And they're, they're looking forward to the chance to praise God. Do you realize that our praise isn't just what happens in the moment, but it's how we prepare for the moment? Here's, here's another way to look at it. How many of us have ever gone to Disney before? Anybody? I used to work for Disney, this is a side note, and this is the way that Pastor Brian almost always introduces me. Like he goes, hey, this is, this is Van, he's director of operations with us here, and guess what? He used to work for Disney. <laughs> but, I, I, so, but, but to the point of, of, of going there, man, I prepare. I prepare. I don't know about you guys, man, sun, sunscreen, check. Man, we got food, check, because it's too expensive to eat in the park. Man, fast passes, check. 
Man, we make sure that I've got every itinerary, we're ready for every princess breakfast, with girls, every princess breakfast, man, every parade. Side note, one of the things that's just a running joke with people who work for Disney, when you have someone come up to you and go, hey, what time's the 12 o'clock parade? No, back to it, back to it. (laughs) But we get excited for these moments. We are expecting something amazing to happen, and what? We don't want to miss it. Man, we suffer from FOMO, fear of missing out. Man, at the end of the day, we're up and we're there. Do we look at moments to praise God in the same way? Do we wake up extra early to make sure we don't miss a single moment of Sunday morning? Do we have FOMO when it comes to praising God? You know, it's a proven fact that we prepare for that which we expect. Do you come in expecting to have an encounter with the living God? I got my Bible. Check. I've been listening for his voice all morning. Check. Man, I'm mentally and physically ready to give God everything that I have. Check. Or as Pastor Brian said last week, do I come in, do I roll in expecting the worship team to be my hype man? Do you guys know why? Do you know, do you know why, I, why I wear a suit? It's not just to look good. How do I? Yeah. I wear one because it mentally communicates to me that something important is happening today. What do you do that shifts your thinking from just showing up to showing up ready? And it's not just the moments of worship that we're talking about, the corporate moments of worship. What does the daily life of expectational praise look like? How many of us prepare for moments where we are tested as Christians? How much do we do? How much time do we spend growing in Galatians 5, 22? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Man, how much time do we spend expecting God to use us? Man, do, do, we, do we wake up early enough on Wednesday morning to make 7.50 a.m. AM prayer? You just got to get on the phone. Man, do we wake up Sunday morning just for service, or do we hop on the intercessory prayer call at 7.15? Shameless plugs. I'm putting them out there. We give opportunity for us to enter in throughout the week to grow our expectational praise. Man, they're, they're, they're always, are they someone that's always looking for an opportunity to praise God? Man, do people say about you, man, they're one of the most loving people I've ever met. Man, they have such self-control. Man, they're so patient. Are we suffering from road rage? The people of God should look different. I'm speaking to myself, family. So... Our praise is meant to be expectational, and it's also meant to be generational. Let's look at verse 15 and 16. It says, when the angels had departed from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And and they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. Now, I've got a question that that, that man that got me for a minute. I really had to stop and, and think about it. It's been 500 years. How do the shepherds even know who God is? How do they know that this moment is so important? Love taking time to look at time. (laughs) And there's so many unique ways that you can look at it. And I think when we change our perspective of what time looks like, again, it hits different. How many of us, how many of us have parents that are getting up in age? Yeah. Yeah, my dad... My mom, who are here today, they surprised me. They didn't tell me we were coming up. Uh, But, and I'll try, this is the spot where I may start crying. How many of us recognize, my dad's about to turn 80. He actually has. He looks great for his age, family. I'm, I'm blessed. But how many of us recognize, if I visit my parents, say, say I visit my mom and dad once a year. My dad's 80. I'm believing that I've got at least 10 more years, maybe 90. Man, that's, that's, a, that's a full life, yeah? And I can look at it as 10 years, or I can go, if I visit once a month, I've got 10 more time. Oh, his neck. Feels different. 
How many of us look at time that way that we begin to get emotional about it when we think about it or we just look at 500 years and go, that was a long time. Now, if we look at the Israelites, if we look at their time, we look at 500 years for them, what's another way to look at that? What's another way to look at it? Generations. Typically, a generation is about 35 to 40 years. That's about a generation of time. So we'll go with 35. So the equivalent would be the promise was made to the, to, the, to the shepherds. The promise was made to their great, 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 great grandparents. That's who received the promise. That's who was given the promise. And it's the shepherds who received it. So the shepherds knew this moment was important. Why? Because the importance of the moment had been passed down. This wasn't waiting on God and he's casually answering prayers in this time. No, this is during the 400 years of silence where God said nothing to them. Remember, I said a page turn for us is a page. 400 years for them. 400 years of silence where God did not speak to them. This message wouldn't have made it if it was just casual conversation at dinner or if it was a bedtime story. No, they got to see their parents and the adults around them praising God on a daily basis. And how do we know this? How do we know that that's what it looked like? Well, we're going to jump to a psalm for this, one of David's psalms. We're going to go to 145, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. And it says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name. When? How long? Forever and ever. What's it? Every day I will praise you, and I will extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. And here it is. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. How do we tell of his mighty acts? How, how, do, how, do, how do the young people look at us and go, man, God is mighty? What does it look like for us? Maybe it's showing up at a school way before the school starts, praying over the students, praying over the teachers. Man, maybe, maybe, if you have children, maybe it's making sure that your kids, their child, your children, their prayer life and their Bible life are more important than their sports and academics. <laughs> our praise is meant to be generational. It's also meant to be expectational. And finally, our praise is meant to be transformational. If we are not careful We can miss the moment to be transformed through our praise. Now, I'll let you guys in on a little secret. I lead worship. If anyone who hasn't been before, I help help to lead the worship team. And you know what? There are times that I get up here, and I just don't feel like it. Yeah? And, And Kylie and the worship team, they do a great job of picking music. But guess what? Every song we do isn't my favorite. And I... Kylie and I had this conversation. It's the same for her. She's like, they're not my favorite. Just because we worship doesn't mean every song hits the button. But you know what? If, if I wait to feel like it, or, or I wait for my favorite song, praise, my praise is a lot more situational than it is transformational. Yeah? So, so, let's look at this. Let's look at this. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep digging. We're going to look at verses 15 through 18. So we can see an example of Scripture. I always love to bring it back to Scripture. Because it, it honestly it keeps me grounded. And keeps me from coming up with a bunch of nonsense. If I can't find it in Scripture, i got to come back to the source. So 15 through 18, it says, When the angels had departed from them and and went into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen him, they made known the statement which had been made to them and told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed about the things which were told to them by the shepherds. If we're not careful, we can miss this moment. The shepherds left their old life. Without pause, they became evangelists. I I can't know this for sure, 
But one thing that I can say is Luke clearly tells us at the beginning of his gospel, at the start of the gospel, he says, I've carefully investigated everything from the beginning to give you an orderly account so that you may know with certainty the things that you have been taught. AKA, if it was important, I would have put it in there. So we look at verse 20, and it says, The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told to them. Here's what we don't see. We don't see the shepherds return to their sheep. Now, for anyone who's been a shepherd or knows the life of a shepherd, the sheep mean everything to them. Everything. They look at them as though they're children. We don't see the shepherds make plans for someone else to take care of the sheep. No, they don't even, they don't even take a moment. They, they realized that Jesus simply being born was more than enough reason to praise him and to leave everything else behind for the rest of their lives. So when we hear the good news that Jesus became, that, Christ, that God became man in Jesus Christ, we need to stop right there and let that hit us. When, when we hear that God became man in Jesus Christ, that's enough. That's enough to stand up and to worship. That's enough to stand up and praise. Because see, if, if we don't have the revelation of what it meant for God to become man in Jesus Christ, then we can't be transformed from the hearing of the rest. So when we say the gospel is the good news, that God became man in Jesus Christ. He led the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we deserved in our place. Three days later, he rose from the grave, proving that he is the son of God and offering the gift of salvation to all who repent and believe. If we don't get that, man, our praise, our praise can't be ground zero for everything that we do. Before we ask him for anything, have we praised him? Before we complain about anything, have we praised him? Before we, before we even go and intercede on somebody else's behalf, have we praised him? The old church mamas have it. They got it. They would immediately lift their hands and they would worship at the start of any song, at the start of any prayer moment, because they understood the transforming power of our praise. So if you find yourself in a place right now where, where you're asking, is my praise what it needs to be? Is my praise mirroring my situation or mirroring the greatness of God? Today is the day to change it. Today is the day. And how do we do that, man? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask for it. And then, then how do we activate it, man? We activate it through the power of our praise. It starts with our praise. So, so we can sing. We can sing songs like, we can sing songs like, because of who you are, I give you glory. It sounds different, doesn't it? Woo! Because of who you are, I give you praise. Come on. Say, because of who you are, I will live my voice and say Lord I worship you because of who you are hey Lord I worship you because of who you are come on y'all sing it with me come on say say because of who you are I give you glory come on in the highest, I boast in the highest level. Who you are, I give you praise. Come on, because of who you are, I will lift it. I will lift my voice. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. And if that's not enough, in those moments when your body is wracked with pain, when the finances are building up and you don't have a way to pay, man, don't, don't go to him asking. 
Don't go to him looking. Call on the name of Jesus. You can say, Jehovah Jireh, Woo! my provider. Come on. Jehovah Nisi. Why? Lord, you reign in victory. Jehovah Who is he? Who is he? Who is he? Prince of Peace. And I worship you because of who? And I worship you because of who? And I worship you because of who you are. Come on, say, I worship you, yeah. I worship you because you're holy. Holy, why? I worship you because holy is who you are. I worship you because you're worthy. I worship you because worthy is who you are. I worship you because you Who is he? Say, I worship you because mighty is who you are. And I worship you, yeah. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Not my mother, not my father, not my sister, not my brother. I worship you because of who you are. Oh, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Hope. Yes, God. Yes. It's for you. It's for you. Hey, it's for you. So, Lord God, Lord God, let us be forever changed. Don't let this simply be a moment, a footnote in our lives, God. But by the hearing of your word, may we be forever changed. May we, may we come into this place different, week after week. God, that we would live with an expectational praise, that we would live with a generational praise, and God, ultimately, that we would live with a transformational praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.